Well, in this paper, what we do is well to show that being proficient in the host language um, improves your chances of getting a better job at the host country. Better job meaning that you're going to get a job that is more commensurated with your qualifications and skills. This is because we have a problem in current labor markets. It's a fraction of the working force is uh, mismatched in terms of, of the job. They have over qualifications or under qualifications or they are mismatched in terms of skills. This has labor market consequences in terms of wages, job satisfaction, absenteeism. In this paper we show that being proficient in house language reduces the chances of ending up in this kind of mismatched jobs. Well, we find that being proficient in English in Australia uh, reduces the chances of being overqualified at your, at your job by 18%. Uh, it reduces the chances of being uh, underqualified in your job by uh, 7% and it reduces the chances of being overskilled at your job by 8%. So in aggregate terms what we find is that host language is, uh, gives you some insurance against the risk of ending up in mismatched jobs. Hola, buenos días a todos. Primero, gracias al CEO y también por la parte que me toca al proyecto de investigación en el que estoy por hacer posible que esté aquí Santiago Gudría. Eh, para mí, aparte de que hace buena investigación, estoy muy contento porque le conozco desde que empecé a hacer el doctorado, él también, hace muchos años ya y me agrada que esté aquí hoy para dar este seminario. Él está en la, en la Universidad de Nebrija, en, en Madrid, y hace cosas de microeconometría. Uh -huh. eh, ha trabajado también en el Banco de España, eh, ha trabajado también en ICADE. Eh, previamente estuvo trabajando 10 años en la Universidad de Madeira. Y, y bueno, ya ahora en la Universidad de Nebrija, aparte de labores de investigación, eh, se está ocupando de, de poner en posición a la universidad en el panorama investigador. Eh, y de liderar un grupo de investigación. Hoy nos va a hablar de overqualification, underqualification and overskill among immigrants, the impact of host language proficiency. Pues, as always, tienes entre 45 y 50 minutitos Perfecto. y luego hacemos una ronda de preguntas. Perfecto. Ah, bueno, os agradezco mucho la oportunidad de... de de presentar mi trabajo aquí como departamento, la verdad es que me siento como en casa y tengo que decir que la primera econometría que yo aprendí básicamente me la enseñó Carlos porque el primer año de doctorado él me explicaba mínimos cuadrados ordinarios a pelo, sin libro ni nada, yo, a mí aquí me parecía muy difícil pero bueno, poco a poco mi vida académica ha ido, ha ido girando en torno a la, a la econometría Comenté con Carlos la opción de darlo en inglés, en español, si os parece la, la doy en inglés porque las transparencias están en inglés. Vale, ok. So this is, this is a joint work with a professor from uh, ICADE uh, University, Universidad Pontificia Comillas. Uh, I think that the title has changed a little bit relative to the previous version. Um, uh, this is the new title, perhaps the, not the last one, but this is the, the new one. It's Overqualification, Underqualification and Overskilling Among Immigrants. Uh, the impact of host language proficiency. What, it, what is this? Um, well, first of all, there is a established topic in the literature. Um, the literature has analyzed during many years how immigrants are assimilated in host labor markets. How immigrants fair once they reach a new country, how their earnings evolve over time, how their employability evolves over time, how their job quality evolves over time, and paying particular, particular attention to the native immigrant gap in terms of wages, employment, and job quality. This literature has put the focus on, on many occasions on the role of host language. Um, host language is a crucial factor um, when it comes to uh, immigrant assimilation in the labor market. Uh, host language may improve productivity at the job. Well, first of all, by host language I mean the language of the country that receives you. 
If, if an immigrant comes to Spain, here we would, we would be talking about Spanish. Okay. Um, so being proficient at the host language uh, makes you, in some occasions, more productive at the job, especially if, if the job involves um, communication and demands oral skills. Um, it may improve communication networks within the firm. The fact that you share a common language with the co-workers makes you more efficient. Um, it gives you superior access to labor market information. You, you reach and you have better knowledge of new job offers, new job, job opportunities. And also you have um, some advantages when it comes to communicating and selling your skills, your CV, your background to a potential employer. I mean, if you have an interview in the host language, your chances of getting the job uh, rise a little bit. Um, so potentially, host language affects you in many ways. Uh, this is at the theoretical level, but also at the empirical level. There are many, many papers. I'm, I'm quoting here just two, three, but there are more than 50 papers uh, showing that being proficient in the host language rises earnings. No matter if we are talking about English, uh, German, Spanish, Italian, always among immigrants, being proficient at the host language rises earnings a little bit. And also, it gives you superior employment opportunities. Okay? So this is what we knew before this paper. And we have worked on this topic for some years now. Um, so this is a well-established literature. Um, the gap, what is the gap? An unexplored question. What is the role of host language proficiency in easing immigrants access to match jobs? This is a gap. And this is what this paper is all about. Our paper intends to fill this gap. What is match jobs? Well, let, let me give you, give you uh, the, the first flavor. Match job means that you uh, achieve a job that is commensurated with your qualifications and skills. We know that in the labor market there are some workers uh, who are not exploiting their potential because they are in jobs for which their education degree was not needed. We are talking, for example, about an engineer working as a taxi driver. You, you don't need a degree in engineering to be a taxi driver. You are not fully exploiting your potential. The acquired skills and knowledge at the university are not being utilized. Okay, so this is being in mismatch job. And there are different kinds of mismatch. We are going to talk about this in, in 10 minutes. But this is the main idea. And this is an unexplored question. We don't know how being proficient at the host language improves your chances of achieving a match job. And this is what we are going to do in the paper. Okay? Um, why job matches are so important? Well, there is another literature, the so-called over-education uh, literature, that shows that education and skills mismatches are a conspicuous problem. Uh, an important fraction of the working force is mismatched in some way. Um, it's, it's a persistent phenomenon for some workers. It's not a short-term phenomenon. Some workers stay in, mis in mismatched jobs for years. And it has negative effects on a variety of items and outcomes. Uh, being mismatched at the job has uh, a penalty on earnings. Mismatched jobs, mismatched individuals earn lower earnings as compared to individuals who are in matched jobs and given comparable uh, personal characteristics. Individuals who are mismatched have lower job satisfaction. And job satisfaction is not a frivolity. People with lower levels of job satisfaction uh, <coughs> present higher indices of absenteeism, uh, lower productivity. So it has meaningful economic effects. Uh, also, it reduces labor or, or worsens labor market prospects and lowers firm, firm productivity. So, so 
um, ending up in a job that is not commensurated with your formal education or with your skills has negative effects on a variety of outcomes. Okay, and this, this is a, there is a body of literature that analyzes this, the over-education literature. Okay, so this paper mixes these two branches uh, of, of uh, research. Since uh, job mismatch, job mismatch uh, is a meaningful and a prevalent, a conspicuous phenomenon, many papers have analyzed the micro and macroeconomic determinants of education and skills mismatches. What are the main personal factors and what are the main macroeconomic factors that explain why some individuals are mismatched in the jobs? The underlying, the underlying question is, well, why people are mismatched? And there are different theories and different hypotheses that uh, have been tested in the literature. Some people are, well, people who end up in jobs in which their education is not being utilized, perhaps are in some way less able or less skilled than other individuals. If you are an engineer and you end up as a taxi driver, this is because you are not a good engineer. Some people think that way. In some cases this is true, but some papers have investigated whether this is the case or not. And there is evidence to suggest that most negative effects on earnings, employment opportunities persist even if you control for the skills and abilities possessed by the individual. I mean, you can observe the education level of a person but you can also ask him about skills, a full set, a full, a full list of skills and see whether those skills are being utilized or are being demanded, demanded at their jobs. So you can map what the individual has in terms of skills what, with what the individual needs at the job. And we find that people with good skills that moreover are being utilized at the job are penalized because they are mismatched. So in some cases, um, good engineers end up as a taxi driver. Uh, not always, but in some cases. Um, moreover, we know that, for example, overqualification, that ha the, the fact that you have excess education, uh, decreases wages among, also among the high skilled individuals who have very good skills. So. Are being much work, workers less able in some way? Well, in some cases, yes, but in many other case, cases, no. So this is a real phenomenon. It's not an observed heterogeneity. It's not an omitted variable problem. It's, this is a real thing. Um, three days ago, I came ac across, th uh, across this report from El País. Uh, it, it was published three days ago. I was curious, first of all, about the final grade at the selectivity um, exam. Some of these guys got 9.9 .9 at the selectivity exam, 9.9 .9 out of 10. And one of them got 10 out of 10. Uh, I was curious, first of all, about the grade and after how they were faring in the labor market right now. And I was quite surprised be because some of them were in temporal jobs and were absolutely over-educated, over some of them. In principle, these guys with such a high score at the selectivity, uh, at the selectivity exam are not lacking a, a relevant academic skills. These are guys with good uh, academic credentials. Some of them got a very high grade also uh, at the university, a final grade. So these are good students who in principle have acquired necessary skills, necessary academic skills. Nevertheless, they have ended up, at the moment, in temporary jobs and in overqualified jobs. So this illustrates a little bit that in some cases, overqualification and job mismatches are a real thing. It's not a problem of omitting variables or that the overqualified are in some way less able. They are real cases. <coughs> so, 
So this paper, what we're going to do is first of all test whether host language proficiency can ensure immigrants against the risk of ending, ending up in mismatched jobs. This is the main question. Uh, we are going to discriminate between different forms of mismatch. I, I will talk about this in, in five minutes, overqualification and qualification and overskilling. And we're going to use panel data from Australia. Why Australia? Well, because we have rich information from that country. Um, we have an, a very interesting Spanish data set, but it's, it's, it, it lacks some meaningful um, information that we need in order to carry this study. There is also, perhaps some of you have worked with, with it, the German Socioeconomic Panel. It's very similar to this, but who speaks German outside Germany? Not many people, so we cannot have an identification variable, as you will see. We need a country that receives people who already speaks English. German, if you are outside Germany, is not very common. Spanish, yes, but we don't have enough information for Spain. <coughs> so what we are going to do is the following. We are going to have 14 waves from the HILDA survey. It has a panel structure and it's um, representative of the Australian population. It's not an immigrant specific data set. We're going to uh, select only immigrants in the second stage, but in principle is representative of the full Australian population. Uh, it has rich information on socioeconomic and labor market characteristics, plus immigrant background. By immig immigrant background, I mean the country of origin of the individual and when this immigrant arrived in Australia. This is a crucial information we need as you will see. So we have rich information about the immigrant. We are going to restrict the sample to the core of the labor market. We are going to restrict the sample to uh, full-time wage earners. Potentially we can add the self-employed but they are a very heterogeneous group uh, and there are other questions, but, but potentially we could do that, but we have started with, with the core part, full-time wage earners. We uh, restrict um, the sample according to age from 21 to 60, uh, and we are going to disregard the agri agricultural sector. This gives us a final sample of some 11,000 observations. Only immigrants. If you take the full HILDA survey, you have almost 60,000 observations. So, like 15% of the sample are immigrants. <coughs> okay, so please interrupt me if you, if you find any, any relevant question. Explaining this quite clearly, please tell me. Okay, so we're going to differentiate between overqualification, blue, underqualification, red, overskilling. Let me define. Uh, very briefly, what is this? Overqualification describes the extent to which an individual possesses a level of education. Yes? How many uh, immigrant population are there in You have like 15% of the sample, 15%, 20%. It depends on the uh, socioeconomic group, but on average, between 15 and, and 20%. Yeah. So, how we are going to define overqualification? Um, Overqualification basically refers to um, a state in which the individual has an education that is above what is required for his or her job. Above. What is required is something we're going to discuss in a while. You are underqualified uh, under, under if your level of education is below what is needed at your job. Okay? And then, what is overskilling? We have to differentiate between qualification mismatch, over and under qualification is we, we observe objective education, achieved education, formal education achieved by the individual, and compare it with what is needed at the job. However, there are also skills possessed by the individuals. We all have friends who don't have an university degree, but they have good jobs. In principle, because they have skills, knowledge, capacities, and abilities that make them very productive at the labor market, but they didn't, uh, uh, they didn't complete an university degree. Well, this phenomenon 
refers to skills mismatches. We are going to differentiate between qualification mismatches and skills mismatches. Why? First of all, because they are different phenomena. Uh, measures of over and under qualification may not capture the extent to which a worker's skills are utilized in employment. Uh, workers with excess qualifications, people with high education levels, master degree, PhD, may still lack skills that are necessary on the job. That's possible. And very important, workers lacking qualifications, formal qualifications, may possess skills that are needed on the job. So we need to differentiate between formal qualifications and personal skills. Okay, so this is objective qualification compared with what is needed and this is the skills possessed by the individual which may be independent or slightly correlated with formal education. These are going to be our three definitions. <coughs> the labor market consequences of formal education mismatch and skills mismatch are very different. A wage penalty, for example, the wage penalty is way larger among the uh, skills mismatched. Being overqualified penalizes you in terms of wages, but being overskilled penalizes you a lot in terms of wages. Um, and the correlation between the two indicators is weak. This is because we observe people with high education credentials, but with not fully utilized skills. And the other way around, we observe people with not much education, but who have many skills and are very productive at the labor market. So the correlation is weak, so it, it is worth discriminating between qualifications mismatch and skills mismatch. And this is what we are going to do uh, in the paper. Well, this sounds like solid, convincing. Now, well, we have the data and we have to mm, make a do with what we have in the data. Uh, how we are going to define what is needed in a job? Well, uh, we are going to follow the so-called statistical approach. What is this? It is very simple and uh, it may be criticized, of course, but if you criticize this, you have to give me an alternative. So, what we are going to do is we are going to go education, uh, occupation by occupation. We are going to calculate the average or the median schooling level within each occupation. And we are going to consider that this is the needed education level in order to work in that specific occupation. This is the statistical approach. We don't have an idea about what are the real education uh, demand in a specific uh, occupation, what we're going to do is we're going to calculate what is the normal, the median, the average education level within that specific occupation. And this, this is going to be our objective demanded level of education in that occupation. And what we're going to do is, well, you are going to be overqualified if your education level is above that level, and you're going to be underqualified if you are below that level. This is the statistical approach. You can criticize it because occupations, even in, in, within a specific occupation, there are many tasks, many jobs. Um, there is a lot of heterogeneity. So we need very detailed occupation information. This is the first criticism. The second is, well, it would be perhaps more interesting having experts assessing what is the specific education level needed in a particular occupation. This is external analysts. They can do the job and there are papers that have used this external assess assessment. But it's very complicated to have this information with micro data. In a panel, it's almost impossible to match the panel with external information telling you for every year and for every occupation what is the required level of, of, of education within each occupation. It's, it's very complicated. But it also exists on the literature. A third way is to ask individuals what is the level of education needed 
for the uh, occupation. This is the subjective appraisal. It also exists in the literature. We are not using it. We could because we have subjective questions, but we rely more. We rely more on the statistical approach. We think it's more objective. Uh, of course, in order to implement the statistical approach, we need information on schooling levels. We have nine schooling levels uh, in Hilda, and we have uh, and we need information on occupations. We have two-digit level um, occupations uh, in the in the Hilda dataset. If we had only three schooling levels, we could not implement this approach. But we have nine different uh, schooling levels. This is uh, for qualification mismatches. What about overskilling? We are going to rely on a subjective question now. There is no way we have to measure this without a subjective question. Um, we are going to ask individuals. This is uh, information contained in the, in the HILDA dataset. How many or whether they are using their skills at their current job. I use many of my skills and abilities in my current job. One strongly disagree, seven strongly agree. We are going to consider that an individual is overskilled if her answer is four or lower. Ad hoc, arbitrary, but we have experience with different thresholds, particularly three and five, and the results do not change by much. Again, criticism, this is a subjective evaluation. You have, may have personal biases. Yeah. Ideally, what we would like to have is a full list of skills possessed by the individual and a full list of skills demanded by the employer. But again, it's very difficult to have this information in, 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 in micro data. You may have this information if you design your own data set for a given year, for a given firm. But having a representative sample of the Australian population, it's very complicated. <coughs> These kind of questions have been uh, used in the literature on skills mismatch already, so we are not the first to, to do this. Uh, what about English? Again, a subjective evaluation. Uh, how well do you speak English? Very well. Not at all. We define a dummy variable that takes value one if the immigrant is proficient in English, meaning one very well, zero otherwise. Again, we have tried with different thresholds, specifically one or two against three or four, and the results do not change by much again. Um, nearly 76% of the sample reports being proficient in English. A subjective evaluation is not very reliable, well, there are some papers that have analyzed the validity of these kind of questions and we find a large correlation between subjective appraisals and objective appraisals in terms of uh, skills, uh, in terms of uh, language skills. You may be subject to some bias, yes, but on average people who report a high score objectively uh, do not have sufficient skills. And people, on average, who report a low score are proficient objectively in terms of English. So we are going to trust this kind of question. But of course, it's subject to some criticism. Okay, okay so what is our econometric approach? Well, a probit model. In principle, we start with a probit model. Mismatch, what we observe, <coughs> is a function of a latent variable, of a latent score. So that if you go above this, thre this threshold, this means that you are mismatched. If you go below this threshold, you are not mismatched. A, a probit model. You have a score that depends on your characteristics. If this score is above zero, this is that you are mismatched. If it's below zero, you are not mismatched. Zero is a normalization. It could be any number. It's, it, it's, it's not relevant. And well, what are the variables we're going to use first? socioeconomic characteristics that are common in this literature plus macroeconomic variables because we think that the probability of being mismatched at the job also depends on macroeconomic variables, for example the economic cycle. If the demand of jobs is increasing, you have more chances of getting a good job. If you are in a recession and employment rate is going up, you have lower chances of getting a good job. 
and this is the crux, the crux of our analysis of, of our study, English proficiency. English proficiency, uh, the impact is going to be captured by theta. Problem, endogeneity. Huh? Endogeneity. Um, this uh, error term may capture unobservables that are correlated with being mismatched and being proficient in English. For example, what if more able, more skilled, more capable individuals are less likely to end up in mismatched jobs and more likely to be proficient in English, which is very reasonable. Smart guys manage to avoid mismatched jobs and are more proficient in English. In that case, you have endogeneity. In that case, theta may be a spurious correlation, implying not causality at all. There is another variable that affects M and EP and is the, what is behind that potential correlation. So we cannot perform a simple profit here, otherwise we are going to have some bias. What we suggest is a B probit. <coughs> we start with a B probit. B probit is uh, recognizing that there are two stages. A first stage in which you explain English proficiency, and a second stage in which you explain mismatch status. Uh, epsilon 2, Epsilon 1, they are jointly distributed as a standard bivariate normal distribution with correlation rho. If rho is different from zero, this means that the unobservables that affect English proficiency, for example, you are a smart guy, are correlated with the unobservables that explain whether or not you are in a mismatched job, if you are a smart guy. So rho, testing for rho, allows you to discriminate between the B probit and the regular probit. If rho is zero, you can rely on a probit. If rho is different from zero, either positive or negative, this means that they are um, uh, uh, confounders and observables that are affecting the first stage and the second stage equation. And our crucial variable here is going to be said, we need an instrument, something that explains English proficiency, but is not correlated with mismatch status. And this is the tricky part of the paper. We need something that is very correlated with the probability of being proficient, but uncorrelated with your labor, labor market uh, performance. <coughs> Another solution, and we, have, we also report um, results with this procedure, is two stage least squares, instrumental variables. Basically, uh, the approach is very similar. In this case, you assume that this function is linear, forget about the probability. You assume that EP is 0, 1, and you perform a linear regression. And again here, a linear regression, as if the observed variable was not binary. Instrumental variables, assuming linearity. It's not very different um, assuming linearity from nonlinearity. And it, this is also a, a, an option, and in the, it's also something we calculate in the paper. But again, you need an instrument set. What is going to be our instrument? Well, first of all, an instrument must be valid and relevant. Valid means it should explain English proficiency, but not, not related with labor market performance. And it must be relevant, it must be explained significantly, English proficiency. What we are going to exploit in order to find our instrument is this critical period hypothesis. This hypothesis tells you that there is a critical age range in which individuals learn languages more easily. Basically, the idea is that if you arrive in Australia when you are 20, and you are not uh, an English-speaking individual, you will never be bilingual. However, if you arrive in Australia when you are two, three, four years, a kid, probably, if you, and if you stay in, in Australia, of course, probably you will be bilingual. We are familiar with this. I mean, I'm speaking English the way we Spaniards speak English. Uh, we, uh, we will never be good at English unless you have lived in an English-speaking country when you were five, six, seven. Uh, so we are going to exploit this information based on this data. This is on calculations. Uh, the blue is 
individuals, <coughs> immigrants, coming from English-speaking countries. And this is age at arrival in Australia. This is people coming from the UK, from the US. It doesn't matter when you arrived to Australia. Either when you, you, if you arrive when you were two or you arrive when you are 18, you are English proficient, proficient because, because your mother tongue is English. It doesn't matter when you go to Australia. You are proficient no matter the age of, of arrival. Uh, these guys are individuals from non-English speaking countries. And it's very interesting to observe that before some age, let's say eight, nine, you can be bilingual if you arrive to Australia when you are very young. However, if you arrive to Australia after nine, the chances of being fully proficient decrease. This is not your age today, this is age at arrival. These, these guys may be 40 or 50 years old, but if they reach to Australia when they were two, today they are bilingual. If they arrive to Australia when they were 16, they are not very bilingual. Okay, so this gap is telling you that you can explain a lot of Spanish, uh, Spanish sorry, English proficiency depending on age at arrival and discriminating by whether you come or not from an English speaking country. And this is going to be our instrument. Specifically, we observe that immigrants whose first exposure to English was after nine exhibit lower skills. So this is going to be our instrument. The instrument is age at arrival minus nine, the threshold that we consider that, well, after this threshold, the chances of being bilingual diminish, and the fact that you come from a non-English speaking country. This is like a penalty function. The later you came to Australia, the lower your chances of being proficient, provided that you come from a non-English speaking country. This is going to be our instrument. You may say, well, age at arrival itself may be an instrument. Well, no, because age at arrival is very correlated with labor market performance. Because if you reach a country when you are 10 or 5, you have more time to converge to the host society, uh, to converge in terms of cultural values, you know. Your, your, your social network expands, you have more time to expand your social network, so you have some advantages relative to people who arrived to Australia when they were 30. So age at arrival itself cannot be an instrument. Uh, coming from an English or non-English speaking country can be an instrument. Again, no, because people from English speaking countries perform differently at the labor market relative to people who are not coming from a non-English speaking country. But the interaction is a good instrument because upon arrival in Australia, immigrants from non-English speaking countries experience everything that immigrants from English speaking countries encounter except for learning a new language. That's the only difference between these two guys. If you consider that people from English speaking countries have some advantage relative to people from non-English speaking countries and this, this, and, and this gap is through language, then this is a good instrument. It's a valid instrument. <coughs> well, these are the um, results when you perform a regular profit. I'm going to be very fast on this. If you uh, calculate a regular profit, you don't have significant effects. That's negligible. This is a 2.5% lower chance of being overskilled if you are proficient in English. 2.5%. Not much, significant only at the 10% level. What is relevant here is well, years of schooling is very correlated with the chances of being overqualified, of course. The higher the education level, the more the higher chances of being overqualified. Uh, underqualified. The higher your schooling level, the lower chances of being 
underqualified. And this is very interesting. Having more formal education is very unrelated with the probability of being overskilled. Normal. Well, but it's 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 it, it's it's a sign that the correlation is lower than previously thought, perhaps, because uh, this is telling you that some overskilled people are people with lower than expected education levels. I thought that overskilled means that you have learned so much at the university that you are overskilled, but this is not the case. What we find in the labor market, for at least for me, it was a little bit. I, I had read some papers saying that, but this is what we found in the data, that the correlation is, is weak. And this is at 1.9%, it's, it's very low. And these are our controls, okay, age at arrival, marital status, previous unemployment experience, well, a, a number of variables, and we also control for region of origin, which is correlated in some cases with um, mismatch status. But these are not the relevant results. Uh, we also control, this a continuation of the table, we also control for microeconomic variables. Not many significant coefficients, but we felt we uh, needed to control for those microeconomic factors. Some of them capture supply and demand effects. For example, a higher participation rate means more competition in the labor market, lower chances of getting a matched job, but we don't find many significant effects. We think that this is because this, um, the source of variation of this variable is, uh, is comparing uh, Australian states and uh, analyzing this, this difference between Australian states, states over time. These are calculated at the Australian state level. And we have also included year fixed effects. So we think that the year fixed effects are capturing national trends and national effects, and these effects are particular effects at the Australian state level. Probably if we drop fixed year effects, these coefficients will uh, exploit, perhaps. Okay. But since we are not concerned with these variables, well, we are not going to comment much on this. <coughs> So this is the English proficiency equation. What are the factors that explain that you are English proficient? Well, we are very interested in this, on this, the instrument. And the instrument is highly significant. Coming after age 9 implies a penalty of 1.5%. If you come from a non-English speaking country, 1.5% is not much. But for example, arriving at age 19 implies a penalty of 15% relative to an individual who came at age 9. So coming 10 years after this guy means that the chances of being proficient in English go down by 15%. And the effect is highly, highly significant. So it's a relevant instrument. Age, older individuals tend to be less proficient. On average, age at arrival is a little bit significant. But this age of arrival is for English-speaking guys. It could be zero, but it turns out to be positive. If, you, if age at arrival is combined with the fact that you come from a non-English-speaking country, the overall effect is negative, because this is plus 0 0.04 minus 0 0.04. 01, so if you come from a non-English speaking country, age of arrival is a penalty, implies a penalty. Uh, previous unemployment experiences uh, make you less, uh, uh, less prone to be proficient in, in, in English. Working hours make you more proficient. We think that this is because you are forced to communicate more frequently with other guys through your job. Uh, well, some, some, some factors that explain um, uh, English proficiency. And this is region of origin. It's very correlated with English proficiency, of course. Uh, the base is the base category, the reference category is Northern Europe. These guys have superior English skills from the beginning relative to most individuals from outside. 
from other, other parts of the world. So they are important country of origin effects. And we have calculated some diagnosis tests. When you perform instrumental variables, it's very relevant to, 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 to report some key indicators telling you whether the, the instrument is relevant. This is the partial air square coefficient, meaning that if we drop this variable, the error square coefficient drops by 6.3%. The total error square coefficient of this regression is 31. This is a linear regression, instrumental variables, to, a, to a stage least squares. 31, it would be 25 if we drop this variable. It's relevant. Uh, the F statistic associated with this variable, which is, uh, this is a, a regular uh, um, statistic used to assess whether the, the, the instrument is relevant, is 92. A standard value are about 10. If, you, if, your, if your F test is above 10, you can consider that your instrument is relevant. In this case, it's 92. And this is a durbin wu hausman test for endogeneity. It clearly rejects the fact that English proficiency is exogenous. It's endogenous. It's determined by unobservables that also affect your uh, mismatch status. So we cannot rely on a simple product. Okay, and these are all results. <coughs> and almost my, my last slide. On the first panel, we have the regular estimators if we perform a regular probit or simple OLS. Not very significant coefficients and very low, very low coefficients. Below, what we have here is by probit and two stage list squares. The nonlinear discrete choice model and the linear model. But the two models are based on an instrument, which is the instrument I showed you before. And these are the results. This is what we get. These results tell you that if you are English proficient, the chances of ending up in overqualified jobs go down by about 18%. If you are proficient in English, controlling for other characteristics, the probability of being overqualified at your job diminishes by 18%. The probability of being overskilled at your job goes down by about 9%. Uh, there are two numbers because this is the average treatment effect and this is the average treatment effect on the treated. Different ways to calculate the marginal effect, but I, I, won't, I won't skip this discussion. And regarding under, under qualification, well, it goes down by about 7%. So, host language proficiency diminishes significantly the chances of being mismatched in some way overqualified, underqualified, and skills mismatch. This is the nonlinear model. If we go to the linear model, the results are a little bit different. A high result for high coefficient for overqualification, a non-significant coefficient for underqualification, and a non-significant coefficient for overskill. You may say, well, this is because this is linear and this is nonlinear. Well, this is, this is a, a second explanation. And the second explanation is that two state least squares report local effects. I, I, I will skip this discussion because I, I, we don't have time, but this focuses on, on a very specific segment of the people and this focuses on the average individual. It's, it's, uh, it, 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 they are reporting different things in reality. So these differences shouldn't be surprising, but they are, um, they are um, a little bit, uh, they, they, they introduce some noise because if we want to sell something to an academic uh, uh, journal or to the press, we don't know what we are going to do, what we are going to say, this or this. And what are the explanations? Well, we don't have explanations. They are different methods, they are measuring different things, and we get diverging results. But if any, we can say that, well, being proficient in English diminishes, more or less, but it diminishes the chances of being underqualified, overqualified, or overskilled. So, conclusions. English proficiency is an important determinant of job mismatches among immigrants. This is what we find. We claim that host language proficiency is a form of human capital that interacts positively with skills and abilities possessed by the immigrant. It somehow reinforces what you have acquired through previous 
uh, labor market experience or through the university. And the results may help policymakers to devise strategies and immigrant policies that promote and guarantee economic and social stability. You know, there is an agenda uh, intended to promote the assimilation of immigrants and so on. Perhaps it would be advisable to provide language courses for immigrants. There are some courses already, but perhaps we can improve the design. Limitations. As I mentioned before, alternative measurement, measurement methods. We have appraised the level of English by asking individuals. Subjective. Uh, occupations at the three-digit level, that would be very interesting. Having more occupations, more detailed information on occupations, but we don't have this information at, in the HILA data set. When we have this information, in some, in some data, sets, data sets we have three-digit level, and we compare the results based on three-digit level occupations with two-digit level, the results do not change by much. Okay? But in this case, we don't have three-digit level occupations. Classification of skills. We are asking individuals, well, your skills are being utilized. Your skills, what kind of skills? Skills on what? Soft skills, hard skills. We would like to have a full list of skills. We don't have it. Uh, and we don't have explanations. Well, yeah, host language proficiency interacts, but how to what extent it depends on your socioeconomic background, why. We don't have much explanations. We don't have like, a theoretical that explains why this is the case. And finally, this is something we have to work uh, in the future, trying to provide a theory. Many papers in this category are basically empirical papers, but we need to start thinking about, well, theoretical explanations that uh, help us to conceptualize these, these findings. Well, and this is pretty much what uh, I can explain today. Thank you very much. <coughs> Please feel free to... <laughs> Well, you're, you're a lucky man because you find you found finally your instruments no, in your database. Something I, I uh, yeah, something I forgot to, to to say in the in the presentation. It's it's written in the in the abstract. It's this instrument is not new. We are not the first to use this instrument. Blakely and Chin, a paper in two thousand and four, provided many instruments have been proposed in the literature, but the best one is Blakely and Chin's instrument, which is this one. Uh -huh. So we are not novel in this. We are we are. Uh, exploiting uh, a previous idea. Uh, the advantage is that it has been tested in many scenarios whether or not it's a valid instrument. Of course, it, it's data specific testing for validity, but there are reasons to think that it's valid and we, we have conducted some. some uh, but we, we didn't have the brilliant idea. No, we, we have uh, copied that. Yeah. And about the level of English and the skills, can all of the papers you have mentioned uh, consider that in the same way as you have done? I mean, uh, as a test, I mean, you ask me what are your skills and I can tell what uh, I think I have. And I'm the same with English, so there is another way to... I mean, you, you mentioned before that it should be better if we could have some kind of uh, test or instrument to be able to check the, the level and the yeah, no, skill because it's not something very, very subjective. As always here, you have a trade-off. If you want a, a more specific English measure, you have to give up something. Perhaps you have to give up other, having a representative sample or a panel or so some papers that I remember, yes, they have more specific skills measures, but they are not representative sam samples. The best, let's say, the best balance I have seen is um, data sets that ask you not only about the overall level of English or Spanish or whatever, but also about your writing skills, oral skills, mm -hmm. capacity to understand conversations. So you have like different items mm -hmm. which gives you more information, but again, they are subjectively uh, appraised. 
objective, uh, objective indicators in representative samples is, is very complicated <coughs> unless you design your own survey with the limitations of... Uh, this is why some, some papers have analyzed the validity of these kind of questions. They, are they correlated truly with objective indicators? They are, but of course some people have some biases. You may, well, there's something very popular. If you inspect the CV of many uh, job market candidates, not in the academy, uh, the, most people say, yeah, I'm very proficient in English, in German, in, and, and then it's not true. So perhaps you may have this kind of bias in, in this, mm -hmm. yeah. This is my topic, but uh, may, maybe in order to test the robustness of, the, of your model, uh, in particular your, your dummy, uh, maybe uh, you come back uh, the slide in which you specify. Yeah, here, here is okay. Uh, yes, uh, this is the maximum uh, between zero and the age uh, at the red at nine. Maybe in order to test the robustness, uh, you can change uh, nine uh, we, we have done on so. the right and on the left, yeah. and uh, maybe the result maintain or they are going to be very different. It is surprisingly similar. Similar. Yeah, you have. We have done this seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Again, because Blakely and Chin did that. And also, we have experience with alternative functional forms. This is a linear function. For example, we have tried with a linear plus a square term of this. The results are very similar. Good. But it, it's similar because it basically tells you when you are going to take the threshold, here or here. But most of the variation happens to the right. So it changes a little bit, but, but not. Yes, there was a there was more information on the uh, level of English studies that the immigrants had before going to Australia. I mean, whether they had previous uh, English training, like B1, uh, B2, or whatever. I think we don't have this information, but it would that be. That would be a way to, to, to measure. To measure English proficiency. Yeah. I will, I, will, I, will, I will check, I will check. I think we don't have that information, but it would be very valuable, yeah. Also, it would be very interesting to have the, the history of migration of the individual to see whether before coming to Australia they have lived during 10 years in the UK, for example. But, um, this history we don't have, but perhaps we have some, well, let, let, let me check, that's an interesting uh, point. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you.